canine teams in service on the transit system. The canine teams spend over 2,000 hours each year working to keep our system safe. These hours do not include training time. These highly trained teams have proven to be a reliable resource at detecting explosives and provide a visible deterrent to terrorism directed towards transportation systems here and across the nation. They continually train as new intelligence and explosive threats emerge. The canines are well socialized and very approachable, allowing them to do their job with minimal impact on ridership. The knowledge and skill set of these canines and their handlers is invaluable and much like emergency management planning, you don't need it until you're faced with a critical incident. The canine teams will be taken out of service as of December 31st, 2020. This leaves the system, ridership, and our operators incredibly vulnerable to a mass injury incident. We must protect our transit dependent community for which TriMet is an economic lifeline. We must ensure that our essential workers can safely get to work. This is especially true given the financial impact that COVID-19 has had on our most vulnerable communities. As we look forward to going back to work and school, to sporting events, parades, and the tree lighting ceremony, we must ensure that we have a transit system that is safe for ridership and our operators. There was a plan in motion for MCSO to take over administration of transit police. There is no guarantee that this will happen, especially with Commissioner Kafori saying last month that these decisions have been placed on hold. Transit police is currently made up of 14 different police jurisdictions, nine of which have officers currently working on the system. CCSO is not allowed to work in Multnomah County, and another agency is pulling out in August. All of this leaves the future of the program incredibly unstable. If MCSO takes command of transit police, they would be expected to provide explosive detection canine services, but I question if there is a transition plan in place for this critical service. It can take a new canine and handler two to three years to become truly proficient and operationally ready. And that's once they're able to secure a spot in the TSA training program. There is also no guarantee that the officers picked to replace PBB handlers will be part of the transit police within one to two years. PBB requires a minimum seven year commitment to the canine explosive detection program. There are options to keep the current program in place with no interruption in service but I do not believe that this has been carefully considered. This is not only a safety concern, but it is fiscally irresponsible. The investment that TriMet has made in the current K-19 teams is tremendous. And to toss that aside and start from scratch does not seem reasonable. Not only would TriMet be wasting the money spent on the teams already in place, the loss of knowledge and experience would be immeasurable. The PBB recognized what an invaluable tool these canines are and is offered to take over the OTA of TSA, which would free up TriMet funds for alternative safety measures as you begin to reimagine what safety and security on TriMet looks like. If PBB held the OTA, the canine teams would be required to spend 80% of their duty time on the transit system as a requirement of the TSA program. Success of future canine teams and the safety of the system system, our ridership and operators demands a thoughtful transition plan for these critical services. Thank you so much. Thank you, Heather, for your testimony. Appreciate it. Jeff, would you want to see, is there anybody else who's signed up this morning? Uh, yes, the next person is Gabriela Saldana. Gabriela, I'm unmuting you. Please test your audio. Hello. <clears throat> Hi. Hi there. Oh, great. Hi, good morning. Um, so as um, they said, my name is Gabriela Saldana and I'm with Opal Environmental Justice Oregon. Um, and yeah, I just wanted to say thank you for having me today. Um, I'm really glad that TriMet is finally considering the question of what community safety can look like. And today, um, I just want to say that, like, I truly believe that community keeps us safe. So in that, I have much less of a testimony and more of a question to you, Mr. Kelsey, of if you would support a community model of safety, um, like a program like the Writer Advocate, and I would like to hear from you, as well as any other board member, about uh, what a community safety um, program could look like and if it could be like that program. Thank you. Doug, maybe you want to wait till the end of the public forum and you can respond to that, but I think uh, clearly that's going to be on the table if it would be my quick answer uh, for her uh, as part of our overall look, and uh, I know that you've talked about it. Is that fair? 
yeah, I, I'm happy to provide comment, uh, probably the general manager's comments. Uh, yes, okay. Thank you. All right. Okay. Uh, we do not have any more hands raised. Um, uh, we've had a few callers come in um, since. So if anyone would like to provide testimony, please raise your hand in the participant panel. Or if you're on your phone only, please dial star three. I'll wait for you a, more minute, a couple more minutes more, Jeff, to see you. Yeah, a few minutes. Okay. Bruce, this is Keith. Um, I, I just want to share that I'm going to have to leave at 11. Okay. Just wanted to let everyone know so that you didn't think I just bailed out on you. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully we'll be done by 11. Oh, thank you. Thank you. So, uh, Jeff, anything, anybody else? Uh, no, it looks like no other hands are coming in. So. All right. Well, with that, then I'm going to uh, close the uh, public forum and uh, call our regular business meeting for Wednesday, July 22nd, 2020, uh, to order. And the first item of business is the board reports. And the first one on the on the list is the Metropol Metro Policy Advisory Committee, or MDEC, as we call it. And direct away, I know you were waiting for some notes since uh, you weren't at the meeting. Are you ready to provide an update this morning? Or? Yes. Yes, okay. I have the notes. Thank you, Bruce. Um, well, good morning, everyone. So um, I had a family emergency on July 8th, so um, I was unfortunately unable to attend the um, impact meeting. Um, however, we had our wonderful staff, uh, Jeff Owen, attend and, and took really great notes. With. Um, so two topics of discussion at that meeting, um, COVID-19 and our economy. Um, there was a discussion around um, acronym CEDS, which stands for Regional Recovery, Resilience, and the Five-Year Comprehensive Economic Development Strategy. Um, it, it's a long acronym. Um, but SEDS is essentially an action-oriented strategy uh, for regional economic development. Um, it is a result of regionally owned planning process designed to build capacity and really guide the economic prosperity and resiliency of our region. Uh, Greater Portland, Inc. Um, has been developing the region SEDS every uh, five years on behalf of the Greater Portland Economic Development District, uh, which includes our three uh, tri-counties um, and Clark County. Um, the SEDS is currently underway and is being developed in direct partnership with Metro and is a requirement. Um, and it's a requirement uh, uh, by the Economic Development Administration for local projects um, to access federal assistant, assistance. Now, um, obviously due to COVID, um, this work has uh, really focused on um, more immediate economic recovery efforts. Um, and so um, there has been an adjustment to both the scope and the timeline for this work. Um, and some of the core pillars for this work um, that we're focusing on is on equity, resilience, and strong economic growth. Um, the SEDS scope and recovery plan will continue the rest of this year, um, and the SEDS will be submitted in spring of 2021 with implementation from June 2021 to June 2026. Um, the second piece that was discussed was um, the Regional Supportive Housing Services Program Overview and Implementation Readiness. Um, there were several different presenters that introduced 
um, the program and the structure and the implementation of the Regional Supportive Housing Services Program. Um, also receive feedback from MPAC members. Uh, this work is being funded uh, beginning tax year of 2021. A tax of 1% is imposed on the entire taxable income of, of over 200,000 if filing jointly and $125,000 if filing sing single. Uh, the supportive housing services revenue will fund services for people experiencing homelessness and housing st instability. Uh, this, work will con this work will include street outreach services, uh, transition and placement services, basic survival support, mental health services, intervention and addiction services, physical health, rent assistance, employment, job training, retention education, legal services, fair housing advocacy, shelter services, and more. And that is the end of my report. Thank you, Director Way. Appreciate that. Uh, questions for uh, uh, Director Way? Hearing none, thank you very much. Uh, let's move on then to our second uh, board report, which is our Transit Equity Advisory Committee, TAC as we call it. Uh, Director Gonzalez? Thank you. Can you hear me all right? Can. Okay. Uh, TIAC met last week um, for our regular monthly meeting. It was a virtual meeting, well attended once again. And in the agenda for TIAC, there were a few presentations from uh, different parts of the agency. The first part of the um, the meeting was around updates on the from the Equity Coalition um, around some of the social equity and uh, let me see, I don't want to get that phrasing wrong. So Southwest Equity Development Strategy, pardon me. The Southwest uh, Corridors Equity Coalition um, went, provided an overview on all of the different types of equity initiatives that are going to be instituted as part of the Southwest Corridor Development. And so TIAC got to hear from the coalition manager, uh, Nuamin Aydin um, from Unite Oregon, who presented on some of the um, anti-displacement measures that are going to be a, established for this program, um, some of the community engagement initiatives, and there was a preliminary list of stakeholders that was presented to TIAC with the invitation to help ensure that it's it's a comprehensive list and we have not um, left any <clears throat> critical stakeholders off the table. Um, so they were able to overview some of the key goals as part of this equity coalition. Um, the strategy includes anti-displacement measures, um, mitigating and eliminating all forms of involuntary displacement, um, focusing on um, uh, BIPOC-owned businesses and um, individuals with limited access to capital. Um, the the initiative is really about advancing economic opportunity for those that will be impacted by this. Uh, development and to expand the breadth and the depth of influence of the BIPOC community, immigrant, immigrant and refugee community, and other um, communities affected by the Southwest Corridor expansion. That was a great um, overview that was provided. And then our, um, our very own John Gardner provided uh, from the Equity, Inclusion, and Community uh, um, Affairs Division um, provided an update on the public safety plan. Um, we've had some robust conversations about reimagining public safety in some previous meetings. Um, there's been a lot of conversations throughout the agency. And so John provided an overview on what is on the TriMet agenda for uh, reimagining public safety. In a similar vein as the past presentation, they invited TIAC members to ensure that the proper stakeholders are at the table. Um, we've invited the the member representatives to bring this information back to their organizations so that we make sure that um, not only their perspectives are heard, but that any willingness on their part to to take part in this and help us get a good answer as a community um, that it's taken advantage of. So I'm guessing there will be some breakout committees around all of that, um, but the outreach is going to continue. The research is going to continue. We're looking for examples of other other cities that uh, other agencies that might be doing something worth looking at um, and um, we'll continue to bring that information back to the agency. Um, that concludes my report on the TIAC meeting. Happy to answer questions. 
Are there any questions for Director Gonzalez? That was an excellent report also. I don't see anybody with their hand raised. So I'm going to uh, declare victory on the board report. So I have an item that I'll talk about at the end of the uh, end of the agenda. Also, uh, in terms of responding to the uh, uh, city of Milwaukee and their decision of, of last month. Um, so with that, I'm going to move into the general manager manager's report. And Mr. General Manager, I know whether you want to start out with the operators of the year celebration. I see we got three resolutions, which are always fun. It's too bad we're not here and uh, with them in in person to be able to congratulate them for the for the work of they they do for the agency. So it's to you, Mr. General Manager. I think you're muted. I have yet to get this right, so sorry. My apologies to everybody. Um, well, good morning, everybody, uh, uh, members of the board and the public. Um, I will comment to, I think, Gabriella's uh, request for a statement, maybe a, a bit at the end of my report, if I may, uh, but to yes to yours. Um, um, I do want to get to the operators of the year first. They are, their pictures are available, and there they are. They're coming up now. Um, and. Uh, there are three operators here, so I want to talk my report today, starting with a celebration um, as we recognize these really important operators of the year. And I'm going to take a minute to talk about each one of them. Um, so I think they're at Center Street right now. I think uh, I see Andrew, actually, I think uh, on the camera and there's Aaron and I don't know if Yama is there. So um, anyhow, we have a, a lot of amazing operators. We have about 1800 operators overall, but these are three of the best in their respective categories selected by their peer group. Um, and I, I think particularly this year of others, I don't think anything in my lifetime, and I'm, maybe yours as well, of their jobs and more challenging and difficult with the economy, with COVID, with protests, with riots. It's been an amazing, challenging time out there. And these folks are truly the best of the best. Um, the first operator of the year I'd like to congratulate is uh, Aaron Bond. Um, Aaron has been with the organization since 2007. Aaron, give us a big wave there on the camera. <laughs> and again, we'd love to do this in person, but we can't. Um, so you, you get a virtual hug from us today. Um, <laughs> he, he advanced um, to the position of a training supervisor before choosing to return actually to back to the driver's seat. So we, the great news is he's still within TriMet helping us every day. Um, even being away, um, Aaron is a senior operator. He has five National Safety Council awards and five superior uh, performance awards. Aaron also, um, which is quite impressive, is 94 months or 7.8 years of perfect attendance. And, and the meter is still counting on that, Aaron. So um, you set a very high benchmark. Aaron also has a very strong passion uh, for the community. He really looks out for his passengers and makes it his personal responsibility helping people make their connections. As we all know, we have a grid and a network, so making your connections is pretty fundamental. He's a dedicated professional, and we're really great to have you here at Aaron uh, at TriMet. So congratulations to you. Um, Mr. Board President, I'm going to go through all three, and then I do have a request of three separate resolutions. I would request of the board to, to pass each of those uh, sequentially. So. Next, um, I'd like to recognize our part-time, or what we call the mini-run operator of the year, and that is uh, Yama Crondall. Uh, Yama has been with TriMet since 2011. Uh, she's a lead operator with eight national safety awards, four superior performance awards, and 95 months of perfect attendance. Aaron, he beat you by one month, 7.9 .9 years um, of uh, perfect attendance. She's also been awarded 100% customer satisfaction and for her on-time performance. Her riders describe her as safe, always on time, and always polite. Thank you, Yama, uh, for your service, and a hearty congratulations to you. The third operator, and I know he's here, I can see him um, sitting at the table right now, um, is uh, the rail operator of the year, and that's Andrew Hicks. Andrew has been with TriMet since 2006, and this is actually his second time winning the Rail Operator of the Year by his peer group. So I, in, in my time here, I can't say I've, I've, I've heard of that. So he's a master operator with 14 National Council Awards and nine Superior Performance Awards. He's also described as professional and polite. Andy, uh, congratulations to you. We're 
glad that you're there driving the trains and making them safe for everybody every single day. With that, uh, Mr. Board President, I would strongly recommend approval of the three resolutions before you, and I think in the board uh, members uh, package today, honoring uh, Aaron Vaughn, Yama Crandall, and Andy Hicks. Um, the resolutions before you are numbered 2007-29, 2007-30, and 2007-31. So, Mr. Board President, if you're comfortable doing that, I would uh, put that forward to the board as a recommendation. Great. Um... First off, uh, uh, is, I think it's all right. I'd like to actually do each one of them individually, if that's all right. Yeah, you would. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So the first resolution then is resolution 20-07-29, which is uh, uh, recognizing uh, 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 the uh, bus bus operator of the year. And uh, and, and again, that's Aaron Bone. Is that what I was pronounced? Bond. Bond, Aaron Bond. So does the board have a uh, willing to make a motion to approve resolution 20-07-29? This is Travis, so moved. This is Keith, second. second. All right. Is there uh, any uh, further discussion on the uh, motion? Hearing none, all those in favor of the uh, motion to approve resolution 20-07-29, please uh, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Hearing none, the motion is approved unanimously. Uh, Mr. Mr. Gerald Manker, is it okay if I ask if Aaron has any comments? I, I don't know whether he has a mic there, but he's uh, more, than, more than welcome to provide us any comments uh, we ought to know about him or this award. Aaron, are you, are you able to speak at all? We can see you. There. I think you're muted. No, I guess we're not going to hear. I don't think we're going to connect with them. I don't think we are either. All right, let's move on to the uh, next resolution, which is the resolution for Uma. Is that what it is, Crandall? Uma, yes. Uma. Yama. Yama, Yama, Yama Crandall. Yama. Yama Crandall, thank you very much. So this is resolution... Uh, 20-07-30, which is commending her as the 2020 mini runner operator of the year. Is there a motion to approve this resolution? So moved. Second. All right, it's we have a motion and a second. I'll let uh, you guys figure out who that was. Uh, seconded. Okay, all right. <laughs> is there any further discussion on the resolution? Hearing that, no, then all those in favor of the motion to approve resolution 20-07-30, please signify by saying aye. 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 So um, is this recipient available to want to make any comments to the board? We want to... Are you, are the, I can see you, Yama. Are you Are you able to speak? Oh, there you are. Yeah. You've, uh, she's wearing one of those amazing TriMet masks, by the way, that we've just come up <laughs> with. Right. It's an honor and a privilege. I'm grateful to uh, have a job during these trying times right now. So thank you all. Well, thank you. Thank you for what you do, and the the, uh, uh, the award I'm sure is uh, richly re uh, deserved. So again, thanks for your service. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Have a good day, everybody. All right. Let's move on to the uh, final one, uh, which is recognizing Andrew Hicks as the 2020 Rail Operator of the Year, which is Resolution 20-07-31. Uh, is there a motion to approve that resolution? So move. move, Lori. All right. And was it second. Keith did the second? Yes. All right. Well, well there we, have, we have the motion in the second. Is there any further discussion on uh, this resolution? Uh, then all those in favor of uh, the motion to approve resolution 20-07-31, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Hearing none, the motion is approved unanimously. Thank you very much. And, and Andrew, uh, I don't know whether you're, if you're close to a microphone there, but... Uh, yes, thank, you you so much. thank you so much. Huge honor, and uh, congrats to the other operators of the year. Thank you. All right, well, you, you're quite welcome. Thank you very much for what you do. That's greatly appreciated. And we're sorry we're not there in person to uh, shake yeah. your hand. Maybe next year we'll get the deal. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. 
All right. Okay. I'll turn it back to you, Mr. General Manager. Great. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, and again, congratulations to the winners. This this is really culminates, with, particularly with the power of the peer group. Uh, just shows you how great they really are. Um, I, I maybe will comment now um, on the item that was raised in the public delegation uh, session around uh, the writer advocates. I think I was asked to comment on that. Um, I, I probably have a few comments here. One is um, over the next 90 days, I think as the, as the public and the board are aware, we're really embarking on a listing session. So comments uh, about writer advocates are also part of this. Um, and I think there, there has been writer advocates in the past. There's different variations of writer advocates. So I think part of the listening session for us is understanding what people feel are what needs and problems we're trying to solve. So um, I think Director Simmons had raised this even at one of the last board meetings around the more we can understand the problems out there and, and the opportunities available to us, then we can determine the types of resources and way we deploy and maybe yes, including writer advocates of some variation. Don't know uh, right now, um, but I think if we look at things like policing, security on the system today, PPI, maybe writer advocates. Um, if we go back in time and look throughout um, North America, there's something also called the guardian angels that were out there um, uh, for a period of time. So there's different variations of what a writer advocate might actually be. And so. I think at the right time for Gabriella and the rest of the public, we'd really like to understand what type of roles and responsibilities and value it can really bring and helping all of us be, again, to our vision, mission and values, welcoming for everybody. Um, so I think please do participate in these as well. Um, I think nothing's off the table at this point in time. There will need to be ultimately rolled up and packaged and we'll be running these things through our blue ribbon committee which we are in the process of establishing uh, very quickly over the next number of weeks. So right, I think writer advocates are part of this conversation um, uh, across the region again. Uh, so those are probably the only comments I would have unless uh, President Warner, you wanted to jump in with anything I may have missed or add. No, that's good. Thank you very much. Okay, okay, thank you. Um, next, I'd like to give you an update. Um, I've got, by the way, um, several six updates. We've just done the first one of operator of the year. Um, but I'd like to talk about uh, the COVID update uh, for you. Um, last week, we had two additional frontline employees who did test positive for COVID-19 here at TriMet. Um, that takes our total to seven. Uh, of the seven we've had since this outbreak and virus started, four of those seven um, um, have come from actually uh, sources outside of TriMet's work environment. So we really have about three here, but some have brought them from home, from work, from partners, from other places. So, but they still are impacting our employees to totally to seven right now. So, we um, have, when we learn of these learn of these results either through OHA or through the employees reporting themselves, um, we just as a reminder for everybody, we immediately uh, sterilize and clean the facilities um, that they had been um, uh, potentially in contact with. And we also um, also uh, kick into our, our uh, contract contact tracing protocols to find out who they may also have been in touch with and try and follow that back upstream, if you will, and um, where appropriate, we advise people accordingly. So, but we do want to send the late the latest two cases we've had. We want to send the um, the employee who's at home right now recovering, and we want to wish them well as well as of course their families. This thing is so contagious for everybody involved. So. Um, in terms of the um, um, permanent face covering, um, I want to give you a quick update on that. We had temporary ones out there on our system. We've now uh, got enough experience with this that our team has gone to procurement and there's a, a local organization in Wood Village that's actually going to be producing the permanent um, type for us. And uh, we, um, we expect installation as they're manufacturing these now that we're going to put on the whole fleet bus and rail uh, that is uh, starting in about three weeks as they uh, they ramp up manufacturing. So we still got if you're using the system, we've still got the temporary ones out there still doing their job, not as durable, of course, but uh, just want to let you know we're really moving to that permanent one um, going forward. Doug, um, we, uh, Doug, I just want to quickly say that I appreciate uh, contributing to the economic development in East County Wood Village. 
is of course in my district. So thank you. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> Understood. Understood. Um, the um, uh, just want to let folks know also that we've been pushing really hard, and I really want to thank um, our maintenance team and Sam Dasu for really trying to push hard here on getting our bus barriers in. It has been a challenge. Um, we know some of the manufacturing is a year stacked up in back orders. The good news is we got our order in right away. Um, these shipments, um, we, they began last week, and so we're moving past 50%, and we'll have probably by the end of August now, all but our spares, our bus fleet spares um, installed. So August 17th will be the last batch before we hit the spare ratio on our, our surplus buses that we'll be able to get that out for our, um, our, our, our operators, which is really, really important for us. So again, to remind everybody, this is not a primary, um, it's not to replace the face covering, it's a supplemental, in my opinion, uh, supplemental protection for the operators. And particularly with assaults being up on operators now um, around masks and other things, this barrier serves far a far bigger purpose than just um, what we thought were original uh, intents of the bus barrier. So it's coming. Um, and finally, the last update I would give you here is um, since March, we've hired a, a, another 30 uh, service workers, 76 cleaners. Um, we're, we're more than halfway there to our goal of getting 150 cleaners in, um, on our vehicles and our systems. So it takes time to hire and uh, hopefully if anybody listening at home tonight, we're hiring. So uh, uh, please, please apply. Um, but anyhow, they're doing a great job out there for us. Um, and uh, it's just a really important time for us to hit. One of our objectives here is to hit four hour cleaning on the system. That's one of our targets. Uh, so whether you're on a bus or you're a train, you're gonna be touched and, and key touch points four hours. Um, the next update I have is on ridership, and uh, I'll bring up Sam Dessou here shortly to talk about our quarterly performance, but for June, uh, we provided more than 3 million trips in June with about 700, just over 700,000 weekly boardings. Uh, that's down more than 63% since last year, uh, but we are seeing an uptick in the phase one reopenings. And I think as we all know, that's fairly fragile right now as there's been some, a bit of a resurgence going on. So we're going to continue to monitor this really, really closely and, of course, work with the, the OHA, the health authorities in the state, of course. Uh, but June ridership was up 5% uh, higher than May. So uh, we do know there are people will respond when the time comes. Uh, so that's, that's encouraging. And we are working on, uh, Bernie Bottomley and his team are working on um, some ridership recovery strategies right now, which we'll bring to the board um, down the road. So stay tuned for that. Um, the interesting point I will make on the June ridership is that um, the ridership increases were essentially equal on both bus and max last month, uh, around 63, 64%. And um, the next item I have to uh, update you on is the steel bridge. And um, uh, this has been something that's been in the works for a few years. And so with ridership being down, I never thought there'd be a silver lining in ridership being down. But boy, if there was one, this would be that time. Um, we're going to be um, taking the steel bridge down for one whole month, and uh, work is already underway behind the scenes. Um, but the big public impact is going to come here uh, very shortly in um, for a full four week disruption, and it will impact all max lines beginning August 2nd, and that's just about a week and a half away. So this is the agency has been building up to practicing how do you do state of good repair and still run the system. This is the largest project the agency has ever undertaken. With uh, It's about $20 million in uh, capital, but it's far bigger than that, if you will, in magnitude to the region. So we're basically disconnecting the rail system on either side of the river uh, for a month. So now I maybe if uh, I can, I'm just going to ask Sam Dessou, our very capable chief operating officer, if you can just, um, uh, Sam's got uh, an update for us as well on a few more of the details around it. So, Sam, are you there? Oh, yes, Doug, I am here. Um, Morning. So, to bring the slide presentation up on the steel bridge. Okay, um, good morning, President Warner and board directors. 
As Doug stated, um, on August 2nd, we're very excited to embark upon this four week long max light rail improvements project on the steel bridge. As Doug stated earlier, also this will be our largest capital improvement project in the 50 year history. Um, we will be replacing and upgrading trike switches and the signal system across the 108 year old steel bridge. Um, and for 34 of those years, it's helped us move people by light rail. The project will help us uh, improve the reliability and it will keep future trains running on time while reducing disruptions and delays. Next slide. The multimodal bridge is the epic center for our entire system with more than 620 trains crossing the bridge every day. The lower deck carries bicycles, pedestrians, and railroad traffic, while max bus cars use per deck. Crews will begin working around the clock on Sunday, August 2nd through Saturday, August 29th. That means that the steel bridge will be closed to bus, to max, and to auto traffic during the project. Although the lower deck will remain for pedestrians, bicycles, and mobility devices. Um, we're going to perform key repairs across this half mile section of our light rail system, mainly on the bridge itself. Um, again, this includes re replacing trike, upgrading our switches, our signal equipment, and then updating some of the older technology that's on the bridge. The scope and the scale of this work is ambitious, but essential to improve our service, our resiliency, and the overall customer experience. Crews will replace the entire rail on the bridge, about 8,680 feet of rail. We will replace two switch sections referred to as turnouts, where the train moves between two sets of trike and each turnout has two switch machines that will be replaced. Two switches on the east side of the bridge will be replaced as well as the two on the west side, which is the most used in our system. Uh, those switches are used nearly 2,000 times per week. We will also improve our signal system across the bridge. We will upgrade it from physical relays to computerized equipment, and we will move sensitive components off the bridge. And then finally, um, our crews will replace the rail lift joints and the locks on the bridge and improve those using technological advancements. Uh, proximity sensors will replace outdated locks. I've had the opportunity to get up on top of the bridge at midnight with our MOW crews and um, this is something that definitely we need to move forward with. Next slide. During the 28 day bridge closure, shuttle buses will fill the gap and our mag service taking riders across the Willamette. For the first 27 days, our shuttle buses will run every two to five minutes between Rose Quarter Union Station, Old Town, Chinatown stations. The project will also affect five bus lines the four, the eight, the 35, the 44, and the 77, which will also be detoured around the bridge. And then on the final day on Saturday, August 29th, the disruption on the east side expands, shuttle buses serving stations between Lloyd Center, Northeast 11th, Old Town, Chinatown, and also between Albina, Mississippi, and Union Station. We have informed our customers to plan an extra 30 to 45 minutes for their transit trips during this disruption. Next slide. Our engineering and construction team and our service planning team have coordinated with the city of Portland for traffic control plans as needed to ensure public safety. Our safety department also has conducted a turn by turn safety assessment for the shuttle bus route. Our G4S staff will be used to clear trains at Park Avenue, Old Town, Chinatown, 
Rose Quarter, Union Station, Interstate Rose Quarter stations, as well as gate transit centers. Our customer experience department has done a lot of work and very important here, uh, have an added challenge during this project that's brought on by COVID-19 pandemic. They will be directing our customers to physically distance on board at transfer points. Signage will be added for queuing at shuttle bus stops. Physical distancing will limit the number of riders on our shuttle buses and our trains. We will also require riders to wear face coverings inside our buses and on our trains, and we will inform and educate riders to use them at stops and stations. Our customer service representatives and our TriMet Ride Guide staff will have additional disposable masks on hand during the project for riders who don't have access to them directly. TriMet staff will be on hand to encourage riders to spread out by at least six feet as they will the shuttle buses and trains. Although COVID-19 requirements are ever changing, we expect to be able to implement a minimum of three feet of physical distance while riders are on our vehicles. And this is scheduled to take place this coming Sunday, July 26. Hand sanitizer dispensers are installed on all of our buses and we're piloting our dispensers on our type five trains currently. Next slide. We launched the project on July 8th by hosting a press conference with local media. We also plan to communicate with riders and the general public in many other ways to spread the word about this project. And here are some of the key channels we plan to use. You can find a great overview at trial.org slash steel bridge. We are T minus 10 days before the launch of this project. All systems are go right now. But I do want to take a moment and really thank all of the employees who have worked tirelessly and effortly to ensure that we are prepared and ready to go. Thank you for your time. Are there any questions? I'm seeing nobody with their hand raised. I think uh, this is a very ambitious project and we wish you luck and we'll, I'm sure we'll hear about this as you proceed. So thank you. This steel bridge has been a real problem for, for years and I'm glad we're finally spending some attention and money on it. Mr. General Manager. Um, excuse, may I interrupt Bruce just briefly? Please, no, yes. Yeah, I just want to thank Sam for a very good presentation and um, and you provide all the information we need, obviously, otherwise we'd, there'd be questions. So thank you very much for a very comprehensive report. Great, thank, thank you, Sam. And to the whole team, um, this has been going on in preparation for about three years now, just so folks know. Um, and uh, if we zoom back out past the steel bridge, Part of this fits with the overall network upgrade, the closing of the train stations that this board opined on last year, this, the red line as we invest the, out the Fairplex expansion, uh, double tracking on the red line. So we've got to get more capacity in our trains. So there'll be trains will be going faster in the future over the steel bridge, as well as upgrades for obvious safety reasons. So uh, let alone longer term getting ready for the Southwest corridor. So you, if we look at this from a network perspective, this is about helping get people where they want to go faster with less time. And this is the one area that is kind of the middle of our hourglass where every single train passes over. So a really, really complex uh, project. And I know the team's going to just, just knock it out of the park. And shamelessly advertising, we're still looking for ride guides. So if any board members want to sign up for ride guides, please let me know. So uh, anyhow, I'm going to move along. Sam, I'm just going to turn it right over to you to jump right in now to the quarterly performance report if we can. Perfect. You could go ahead and pull up the quarter report. Okay.
Okay, good morning, President Warner and Board of Directors again. Um, I'm going to be presenting to you 2020 first quarter system performance report highlights. Uh, we were scheduled uh, last month, but we delayed with all of the budget approvals to this month. So I will compare the first quarter 2020 performance to the first quarter 2019 performance. There are a couple of key highlights here to talk about with this report. Uh, one is the decrease in relative violations by 40%. And the second is our max light rail collision rates are the lowest in the last five years. Next slide. So as you can see here, um, we had a slight on-time performance increase for fixed route bus and a very slight decrease for max trains, but essentially stable here. So we're continuing the emphasis on leaving the town. Next slide. Looking at our West on-time performance, we had a slight increase over 2019. Um, our West on-time performance has really recovered nicely uh, after the positive train control work was completed. I uh, want to give a congratulations to Darren and, and his crew down at West doing a really good job for us on the commuter rail side. Next slide. Our fixed route bus complaints per 100,000 boardings uh, for the past two years Complaints have remained relatively stable uh, for all three areas. And this is an area that uh, both uh, Director Way and, and Edwards had asked to kind of break down um, our complaints here. So we've had 1,600 complaints in that first quarter of uh, this year uh, from 13 million boardings. One is too many, but um, just wanted to kind of lay that ratio out 670 were service delivery complaints, um, 492 were public relations, and then 440 was safety complaints. Next slide. Also here is our Mike's operated complaints per 100,000 boardings here. They've remained stable also in all three areas. Out of 8 million plus boardings, we've had 160 complaints. 61 were service delivery, uh, 79 were public relations, and 28 were, were safety here. Next slide. We have great news here. Um, we've decreased our rail rule violations by 42% per 1 million miles. Our rail training group um, has taken a more proactive approach. Um, I just want to congratulate all of our rail operators here. This is a kind of a monumental uh, effort here. Uh, I want to congratulate also our training and rail management staff. Job well done here. Next slide. On lift, um, we have increased our miles between road calls by 51%. And this is due to replacing older vehicles. Um, we've replaced 27 vehicles in the last two years. This is another thing, uh, thankful uh, point here of thinking Margo and, and her mom on what they're doing with what I left group. Thank you. Next slide. As you can see here, um, we've increased the distance between failures by 16.6% .6 on our fixed route buses or 2,300 miles. Um, Ed Bennett and team has triage vehicles. They've replaced uh, the least reliable buses. Uh, do wanna go back and thank Ed and team also for the barriers that we will be bringing in on the buses. So. Many things to our maintenance personnel. Next slide. Back main, main distance between failures has increased by 
Um, this is due to decrease in uh, propulsion failures uh, by 36 percent. Um, here, you know, as we decrease these failures, the more miles between failures mean higher train reliability and more in service miles. So, so Dan Blair and his team has done a really good job here um, with with reducing the failures. Next slide. Our fixed route bus collision rate uh, per 100,000 miles. Great news here, we've decreased by 12.9%. This is one of our lowest in five years. The decrease is primarily due to the reduction in mirror strikes and fixed object strikes. Um, in quarter one, 2019, to put it in perspective, we had 335 collisions in that quarter. And our first quarter of, of 2020, we had 302 bus collisions and we traveled 6.7 million miles. So again, job well done. Our bus operators, um, um, our train operators, they're the lifeblood of this organization. Our train and our bus ops maintenance teams and management teams, uh, thank you. Next slide. Our final slide here is um, our max light rail collisions per 100,000 miles. We've reduced the overall collisions by 7%. Um, our overall rate remains very low. We've traveled 1.1 million miles with only 15 collisions. And then again, just tremendous hats off to our rail operators, to their maintenance, to their management, job well done. So. Mr. President, this concludes the highlights of our first quarter 2020 performance reports. Are there any questions? So I'll turn to the board. I'm not seeing any hands. Okay. So I think, I think you've uh, impressed us, Sam. This is great news, all of it. Uh, nice, nice work. Please pass on the congratulations from the board as well will do yeah yeah if we go back to rail violations um uh to the work sam and the whole team's been doing back in 2016 we had uh, about 1244 rule violations people opening doors on the wrong side speeding things of that nature the most recent report was down to 140. so if you translate that when you've actually added the orange line into it capacity since 2015 um the ratio is, is really, we have not finished. You never finish on this till you get to zero. Uh, but uh, the team deserves just a lot of credit on a fundamental cultural change and approach to this. And in fact, if you overlay, I call it the scissor chart, and I'm updating it now, is where your on-time performance has gone up over that same period, and your rail violations have gone significantly down. So literally over the same period, the lines have crossed. So you can run on time and you can be safe. I think the evidence strongly shows that and other transit agencies have done this. So um, I, I think it's a real tribute to what Sam and the whole team have been doing. So thank you, Sam. Um, the, the, I know this has been a long GM uh, update uh, this morning. And I apologize for that, uh, but we've got lots of news to talk about. So the last one I've got is I'd like to, um, uh, again, this is following up from the last board meeting the finance and audit committee where we gave an update on uh, transit-oriented development from two board meetings ago where the policy was passed. And I'm gonna ask Lance Erz and Guy Ben, who are heading up this uh, area, to talk specifically about one property that we put, had been looking at for actually about two years now, uh, two to two and a half years. So um, it's a property we own. Um, I know you think you know, uh, I know you know Hollywood Transit Center, so I'm just gonna turn it over to Guy and Lance to walk you through uh, the current status of something that's, I think, the start of really ex some exciting work here. Thanks, Doug. Uh, President Warner and directors, um, like Doug said, we approved the uh, TOD guidelines in May, which was a, a great milestone for our team. And we are here to give you the first quarterly update. Um, we're actually going to talk fairly quickly on two topics, Hollywood Transit Center, like Doug mentioned. And also we wanted to give you a more of a general overview on what we are doing to advance our kind of greater QAD program goals and strategies. And we have been privileged to have received two substantial grants 
that will help us uh, with that work. And so, um, uh, by no means is the, are these the only things we're working on. There are many other, many other projects we're pushing forward. Uh, but in the interest of time, we're going to focus on these two things today. So I'm going to turn over to Bob Hastings actually to talk a little bit about the um, about the overall program goals and strategies for achieving the goals and the uh, grants we've received. And then Guy will talk a little bit about um, the Hollywood Transit Center, and we'll try and do this fairly quickly um, in the interest of time. So, uh, Bob, take it away. Thanks, Lance. Next slide, please. And next slide, please. Uh, so members of the board just want to relate to you that, uh, as Lance mentioned, we had applied last fall for two substantial uh, grants to advance our uh, transfer and development and stationary planning efforts. Uh, the first grant that we received was through um, ODOT's uh, Transportation Growth Management uh, Program. And uh, that will allow us to look regionally uh, across our system and looking for specific typologies. That's our $5 word, meaning how can a different transit-oriented development uh, scenarios really be brought um, almost to a market-ready condition um, in different places around the region. Part of our guidelines uh, specifically was to address that we knew transfer development could happen across the region, but it had to be site specific and it had to be uh, culturally responsive to its community and to its neighborhood. Um, so we just uh, selected the um, consultant uh, team that's gonna help us to do that, uh, again, in partnership with ODOT, and uh, we'll get going on that this fall. Community engagement is something that's foundational to our transfer development work. And both of these grants are gonna have a very strong um, activity along those lines where we will be looking at folks um, across the region and looking at particular neighborhoods to bring together advisory groups to help us identify what are the needs and goals and objectives that are really important in each neighborhood. The second grant is the uh, one that we got through the Federal Transportation Administration specifically on transit oriented development. And this was done in uh, coordination with the uh, Better Red, the Red Line expansion. And we're looking at, um, uh, next slide please. We're looking at specific areas along both the existing Red Line, um, uh, Park Rose and Gateway uh, Transit Centers are uh, key, uh, station areas that we're going to be looking at and also looking across to the west side um, through Beaverton and out to Hillsboro, um, looking from Millican Way out to the expansion of the red line to the Fairplex station. Uh, again, very similar in terms of methodology, but just much more uh, broad in uh, the application that we can use the funding for the FTA grant to, again, look at specific station areas that we have, look at properties that we already have uh, control over park and rides, uh, transit centers, but also with the station area, look at how the work that we do can be catalytic to expanding uh, access for folks to, again, leverage our transportation system. Next slide. So these are the key uh, deliverables that we're looking to do within both of the grants. Um, we want to analyze and understand what is the development potential uh, for these sites. Again, it's going to vary, very uh, depending upon markets. It's going to vary depending upon what the neighborhood context is. It's going to vary depending upon you know the age of the transit center that we have and some of the considerations as they were originally created. Uh, but we also have to look at not just what the market is today, but where could we go with our work in. Um, getting greater density and greater mixture of uses at the various sites. Again, through this engagement with the community, they will be with us really coming together and identifying at the end of the day, ways that we can deliver um, specific development projects, both for properties that we control, but also to help um, be a, um, uh, a catalytic uh, force within the various communities. So city of Portland's engaged with us on the FTA project uh, specifically the Bureau of uh, Planning and Sustainability, as well as Prosper Portland. Uh, in Beaverton, we have um, City of Beaverton participating with that, Washington County participating with this, and also Hillsboro. All of us dedicating 
time and efforts and funds to leverage the, the grant funding that we're going to get uh, to bring on our consultant uh, teams. So we're looking to get that RFP uh, or actually two step for the FTA grant then uh, this summer and going into the fall. And uh, the timeline for this again would be to start this year and then the work progressing uh, through 2021 and then coming out in 2022. But as we know, things pop up all the time and we're open to other uh, opportunities sort of coming over the transom. Um, and Guy's going to talk a little bit about uh, the Hollywood Transit Center, but as other opportunities pop up, having a grounding of the um, TOD program that's based upon both analytic work, but also community engagement, I think is going to give us the ability to be more nimble and more responsive as those opportunities present themselves. And I turn it over to Guy Ben to talk about the Hollywood Transit Center. Thank you, Bob. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, good morning, board president, uh, board directors. Um, so it's my pleasure today to brief the board on the Hollywood Transit Center redevelopment proposals. Um, to start off, I'm going to summarize the project, its branding and goals. Um, and as you can see from the slide in front of you, the, the project as a whole um, with the development team has settled on a brand called Hollywood Hub. And, and the, the concept is, you know, this, um, is going to be our hub for transit equity in the community and uh, you know, we are looking to deliver a mixed income mixed use transit oriented development that honors the site's recent history it embraces the district and it delivers essential housing in particular affordable housing uh, as well as improving transit accessibility area safety creating new public spaces and community amenities and also, importantly, replacing outdated TriMet infrastructure. Before I jump into the project details, I should just inform the board, uh, you know, just to recap on the conversations that we had with the Finance and Audit Committee last month. Um, and where we stand is that um, we are currently looking at um, a way to bridge, there's a funding gap that exists. Um, and this really is a consequence of a decision to uh, deliver this project in two phases. Um, uh, because of the COVID-19 crisis, property development, market rate property development has become very challenging. Um, so we, uh, you know, as a TOD team, working with our development partner, um, took the decision to, to break it into a two-phase project. Um, the first phase, um, which I will talk about in more detail in a second, is, is the affordable housing phase. Um, but for the project to move ahead um, as well, we need to deliver all the infrastructure up front. So ultimately, what we have is we have infrastructure costs and we have a lower receipt from uh, the first phase because we're not you know, receiving any revenue from the second phase land. So we're working with the development team at the moment to to basically value engineer the projects and the infrastructure improvements to minimize the funding gap. And ultimately, what we anticipate that there, there is likely to be a small funding gap. It's currently around a million dollars, um, which uh, we're hoping to further reduce. But that funding gap should be eliminated or be recovered uh, once we move forward with the phase two development. Can we move to the next slide, please? So this slide shows a plan uh, of the first phase. This is a ground floor plan. And, and as I, you can see, as I said, it's 120 or it's 100, between 110 and 120 affordable homes. Those will be made available to uh, residents who are, have a area median income that is less than or equal to 60% of the area median. Um, it is also in phase one going to deliver uh, the bulk of the amenity and community space and all the infrastructure and improvements uh, that, that, that we'll discuss further in a second. Um, I think what's important to note from this slide is um, that um, we've worked with the development team uh, to maximize the amount of affordable housing that can be delivered on this site. And, um, just to uh, sort of to explain without going into too much detail um, that uh, you can see a purple dotted line on the plan and that is a census track boundary and ultimately anything that sits 
to the east of that boundary uh, has much, uh, basically receives much fewer tax credits, which makes it impossible to develop affordable housing. So we have a limited footprint on which to build affordable housing. And as you can see from the plan, we're looking, you know, we're really using that with our development team to deliver as much as possible. What you can also see from this plan is uh, the second phase quarter block parcel, which is this area um, in the middle of the plan that's outlined in the black dotted line. Now, initially, um, the proposal is that will be used for construction staging to help the construction of the first phase. Um, if the second phase development has not begun, uh, you know, by the time the first stage phase is built, then it will probably be used as a temporary public space until the second phase moves ahead. In terms of uh, what is buildable on the second phase parcel, um, you know, it, it really depends on the economics uh, of the market. And, and obviously, we're hoping that the market will recover, uh, you know, in, in, in the near future. Um, but it could be between 60 to 100 homes or possibly a, you know, a 10 story or even higher you know, commercial building that would deliver around plus or minus 80,000 square feet of office. Next slide, please. So we talked quickly about the public benefits um, that uh, the project's going to deliver. Um, most importantly is that it delivers much needed affordable housing. Um, within that, um, within the project as a whole as well, we are also looking at delivering a lot of, you know, community space and improving the environment of the Hollywood Transit Centre. You know, we've, we've heard a lot of feedback from various stakeholders from the neighbourhood about safety and lighting and just the general uh, accessibility and usability of the existing transit centre, which is now somewhat outdated. So the, the new project will deliver what we're calling a pedestrian per se, it could also be considered a, a market street a courtyard and amenities. Um, it will have you know, improved ADA access to the Hollywood Max uh, light rail uh, station and platforms and improved bike access. Uh, there will be a new public bike room with an, which will incorporate an active transportation hub for bike share, scooter share. And there will also be, which is significant because uh, you know, it's very much needed, new TriMed infrastructure, uh, an operator bathroom, uh, a new substation, which uh, is very much needed, and new bus stops and pull-out areas that will be able to accommodate 60-foot articulated buses and will have destination board arrival uh, information. Uh, there will also be, uh, a, as we know, there's going to be space uh, for a new permanent memorial to the May 2017 tragic events that occurred at Hollywood Transit Center. Now, um, we're running a dual track process. Uh, you, with regards to the memorial, um, you know, our community engagement team has been working with the families for, for a long time now to, to ensure that uh, there's a pro pro proper commemoration to, to the events that happened in May 2017. And the, the current stage is that we are working with a national specialist uh, to run a workshop, uh, which will then define how we move forward um, with a uh, sort of a community engagement process and identifying the appropriate type, shape, form, scale of a memorial. So, so that is running alongside the development process. Um, the other public benefits are going to come with the project is safety improvements to the Halsey and 42nd Avenue Junction. And as you can see from the renderings here on the right hand side of this slide, we're working with PBOT um, on a couple of fronts. Um, firstly, we have uh, an in principle agreement uh, that PBOT will vacate the portion of 42nd Avenue between Halsey Street and the light rail. So that allows it to become a, a pedestrian and bike friendly uh, passageway that will lead through uh, an activated market street that will lead through to the light rail platforms. It also allows us to redesign the junction at 42nd and Halsey, which is notoriously difficult and dangerous. So, so there's something that's also work in process. And finally, you know, I've put it as a public benefit 
you know, we will have this unencumbered phase two parcel, which can be market space uh, or, or sort of community space initially, if it's not developed, and then we'll ultimately deliver new community oriented development that will further help the Hollywood neighbor. Next slide, please. In terms of um, project partners, um, you know, we, we've worked hard to identify, uh, you know, best in class project partners. And, you know, the, we ran a process uh, in 2019 to identify a partner, which ultimately ended up with Bridge Housing being selected. Uh, many of you know them. Uh, they're a best in class affordable housing developer. Um, they're headquartered out of San Francisco, but with significant presence in Portland, where they operate and have constructed 1,100 homes. They're led locally by Kurt Krieger, who you know has served you know at you know in the city and elsewhere. Um, and they have uh, you know in terms of project and track record, they have um, uh, delivered many projects across the city. Most notably, recently the Vera Affordable Housing Building in the Southwest Waterfront. The urban design is by Holst. Uh, that is a disadvantaged business enterprise. Uh, Women-led architecture practice, um, uh, you know, based in Portland, and then community engagement, which is so crucial in today's environment. We're very lucky to have Dr. Stephen Hull and Dr. Eric and Warren on uh, on board from Tri Excellence LLC. Uh, they've been working most recently on the Rose Quarter uh, uh, Albina Vision project on, on I-5. Um, and they have deep experience working in Portland with local communities, local government and private institutions. Next slide, please. Um, uh, so just to go back, uh, community engagement and pre-development, as I said, this is really um, key to the project. And, and this is, you know, we wanted to inform the board today on, on the process. Um, in many ways, this public meeting is one of the first uh, fully sort of formal public engagements uh, concerning the project. Um, the website for the project, which is Hollywood Hub PDX, went live on Monday, and there is now a link to that uh, on our TOD website. Uh, there's more detail on, 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 on the project on that website. Um, we have, uh, you know, commenced uh, sort of stakeholder engagement. And in the time of COVID-19, it's super difficult um, because you know, we're very aware that not everybody has access or regular access to the internet or you know, is even comfortable you know, using virtual medium for, uh, for communication. So we've also sent out uh, on Friday last week, a direct mailing was sent to around 5,000 local area residents um, using uh, TriMet facilities supporting the development team there will be email lists and notifications that will be sent out to people that register. Um, we're going to deliver on-site uh, notices and local media notices informing people about the project. And we will conduct initially virtual open houses and then in-person open houses when uh, the public health, uh, um, public health conditions allow. Um, the timeline for the development is, is, is at the top of this slide. Um, you know, we, we, commenced outreach um, and that's going to continue over the summer and continue with the pre-development work. Uh, we are very confident that we will reach a final agreement with the development team in terms of the land transaction and the development agreement probably in the next uh, three to six weeks at the latest. Um, and the development team will be looking to uh, use city and state funding to or secure that city and state funding to move forward by the end of this year, early next year to start construction uh, in 2022. Uh, in terms of the groups that we uh, will be engaging, um, you know, we, the, the priority is um, engaging, uh, you know, we will engage with all stakeholders. The priority is to engage with communities of color and other key organizations. And you know, the TriMet uh, community engagement team is working with the development community engagement team to a coordinated response advised by Tri Excellence. Um, we are, of course, informed the family members and other parties impacted by the events of May 2017, and they are, you know, being very closely informed about what's happening and obviously allowed, you know, we're looking forward to their input and feedback. Uh, we'll be working with the neighbourhood business associations, coalitions uh, and local area residents, and of course, local city officials and staff. 
So uh, that is it. Um, we can go to the next slide. Um, there's an aerial shot, I think, of the property here to give, you know, hopefully a better impression of what it could look like, you know, once phase one and phase two are developed. Um, and we would welcome any questions on this project or on any other, you know, items within the TOG plan and program. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Uh, questions by board? I've, I've got a question. Please. Zazi, uh, thank you for the overview of the presentation. It's great to see it. It's moving forward. I missed in the presentation if you mentioned that there was any sort of variance, zoning variances or anything from a planning and zoning um, perspective that we um, that we encountered here um, that we were navigating. Um, that was that, that represented a change from from traditional zoning and variance. I'm very curious to know if we're ever bumping up against those sort of barriers. Um, not as such. Um, you, you will note from um, we were only shown the ground floor plan of the affordable housing building, um, but that building has no car parking um, uh, because this is such a connected location. Um, that, you know, car parking, our, our development partner, Bridge Housing, has deemed car parking is not required um, for, for this building. And that is a, I mean, it is a, it's an allowance, it's within, uh, you know, city uh, zoning code uh, that that can occur. Um, where, where we may seek a variance, uh, and it's something that we are working on and looking at in terms of the phase two plan, is whether or not, if we were to deliver an office building on that site, whether or not we could deliver that office building without car parking, or if we were to deliver a larger residential building, whether that you know could be delivered without car parking, or if economic conditions allow, and it really relates to the cost of construction and, and rents, could we deliver a building that is higher than 120 foot on this site? That is, that's the current maximum height allowed for this neighbourhood. At this time, we're not proposing any height variance, any for FAR bonuses. At the moment, we, we haven't, but we haven't really, other than putting aside a phase two parcel for, for, for developments at a later date, we haven't you know, worked on the feasibility of the phase two development. We, we, we're parking that and, and land banking that for a future time. Thank you. Director Randall, I see your hand is up. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, I had um, uh, a few questions. Um, the first was, um, how many proposals have been received uh, thus far um, in regards to the consultant team? And um, are we looking at the demographics of the consultant um, team and the organization as well? Uh, yeah, so to answer your second question, um, so uh with the consultant team uh so with with the team that's being selected is the sort of the development team and also uh with their subcontractors which will be the general contractor and, and the subcontractors um we the 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 criteria that it meets is a 30 percent uh mwbe uh across the board so so we are looking at having a you know a diversified uh, consultant team working on this project. Um, I your your first question a little bit unclear in terms of, I mean we received four different proposals when uh, you know TriMet ran uh, an RFP for this site, and, and uh, you know Lance and Bob uh, led that effort, and, and ultimately uh, you know we selected the proposal that we felt was most appropriate and delivered the most you know, benefit to the community, benefit to TriMet. Um, uh, now it's within the development team as to how many, you know, with, particularly with Bridge, as to how many groups uh, they want to tender their you know, work to. They, I know they've spoken with two different general contractors for the project. Um, so I hope that answers your question. Thank you, thank you, it does. Um, what is the percentage of uh, market rate to affordable housing? At the moment, this project is 100% affordable. Um, now, uh, if uh, we were to deliver the second building and, and assuming no variance and the maximum amount of residential, 
it would be probably 55% affordable and 45% uh, uh, market rate. Um, you know, there's a strong potential and we're looking at options of um, delivering that second building. One of the areas that we're keen to sort of look into is can we deliver what we call the missing middle, which is housing that is uh, between 80 to 120 percent area median catering to residents that have an area median income of 80 to 120 percent. So, so or it, the, the second building could have could be entirely affordable. It depends where the funding sources allow. Um, I mentioned the census track boundary. Um, as you know, there's a census this year. That boundary may well shift. And if that boundary um, uh, you know, shifts further to the east, then there's a higher possibility that second site could be uh, all affordable housing or certainly contain more affordable housing. Thank you. Um, have, are there any considerations or has there been any thought in regards to houseless um, individuals, houseless folks that, that um, trust me, they, they will be in the, in the area? Um, so, has there been any thought or consideration of that? Um, yes, yeah, so within the affordable housing element, um, uh, you know, it, it's controlled by the, 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 the project will be funded um, from various grants um, from Portland Housing Bureau, from Metro, um, uh, and using low income housing tax credits. And then, conditional to those grants, is that a percentage of the units within uh, the project have to be made available, uh, some are for low income, which is 60% AMI, some are for very low income, and then some of it, which is 30% AMI, and some of those units within the 30% are also uh, supportive housing. Um, so, uh, you know, the we, we, TriMet doesn't control who qualifies uh, for those, uh, you know, within those different uh, income brackets. Um, that is done by the Housing Bureau, um, but you know my understanding is that that that, that uh, you know houseless people are eligible to you know can, can fall within those uh, you know very low income brackets. That makes sense. Thank you, and it, it would be great. I would hope that you know that um, the board, the rest of the board, would concur that it would be great if we could be lobbying on behalf of um, a certain portion of that be considered for houseless um, individuals and houseless folks. Um, yeah. My last um, question or comment, I guess, would be in regards to the memorial. I would hope in uh, respect of the um, victims and the victims' families that um, there would um, not be any mention of the or um, any kind of reference to the um, perpetrator of the crime. Yeah, no, we, we agree. And this is why, um, because it is such an important um, issue um you know we we with the development team concluded that it was important we had a national expert um uh to to handle this so that it's not simply a trimet decision we are guided by by a real specialist in the field um and i'm sure that from the workshop um that uh you know we will have some good guidance that we can then recommend and engage with the community as to how how to move it forward um what I would say to that um, is that, you know, within the development, um, within the phase one development, there's lots of scope to do different things. And, and that, you know, there have been discussions uh, about whether it's a physical memorial, whether it be a mural on the side of the building, it can be a living memorial, it could be uh, converting the immunity space into a community room for meetings, and that can be brand named and branded accordingly. Um, it could take in the form of education. So there's a lot of different scope that we're looking at, and this is why we're taking on some specialist advice to, to work out how we handle that best. Thank you. Thank you very much. Director Bauman. Yes, thank you. You know, you know, first following up on, on Keith's comments, the current memorial there is so uh, powerful and so moving. Um, I, I hope we'll come up with something uh, equally um, equally powerful and that will at least preserve photographically what's there now so that um, perhaps it can be displayed in some form. Um, here's my question though, um, for phase one, 
is there going to are you contemplating com any commercial development or will it just be housing what are you what are you picturing there it's it's there's no commercial development within phase one it's all housing reference to community spaces what does that what would that include what does that mean so there, there there's two the community spaces um are um the there's a public courtyard and paseo um so uh which will be the, the concept is that they can be used uh for gatherings for markets um for events um uh and uh so they they can be gathering spaces and hollywood is already and, and the current memorial already forms as a de facto gathering space often for community groups or for, for groups of people um and that's why we're thinking as well we i take on board your comments about the the power of the current memorial the challenge with the current memorial is it is an ada ramp to access the station it's it's outdated and and, and needs to be improved um, so we're looking at how do we replace that uh, and also replace the memorial that is part of that structure. So, um, so, so that's sort of part of it. Um, and then the other community space and Bridge is looking into this as well is that within the building, if um, we go back to uh, the plan, which is um, uh, on slide seven of the presentation, um, you can see at ground floor level, um, uh, there is, um, uh, I don't know whether uh, the moderator can take us back to slide seven, if that's possible. Um, here we go. One more, please. One more. That's it. Um, so on this plan here, um, the, there's an area which is um, a sort of trapezoid shaped, uh, it's a cream color in the center of the plan. That is a public amenity space. Um, so that could become a, uh, a, it could either be amenity for the residential building or it could become more great as sort of a larger public amenity for the general community. So we're looking at that. Um, you know, in phase two, we're thinking about ideas, other community facilities, be they, uh, you know, daycare center, you know, some form of dropping health center. There's lot, there's obviously countless different things that, that could be included as, as community amenity and, and, and spaces. Thank you. That's all I have. All right, I see no further hands raised. Are there any further questions for uh, the team? Okay, Doug, back to you. Thank you. Uh, I know this has been a, uh, a lengthy GM report, but I, there's a, this is a pretty active agency right now. And I thought this was a uh, great example of some of the work that Guy and Bob and Lance and Shelly and the team's been working on. Uh, and uh, I think it's very exciting here. Uh, what we're trying to do is if we think back also this has been a cost to the business. The goal is how do we create places, um, in, increase our ridership, increase our density, um, help low-income ho homes, get rid of our cost structure, make our assets sweat. Um, so this is an example where this all starts to come together. Um, and I, I'm pretty darn excited about this. Uh, and I really want to tip my hat to these folks. So that will conclude my report. Uh, and I apologize for the length of this one, uh, but there's just a lot going on right now. So thank you. Thank you. I'm going to make it a little longer, Doug. Because Aaron, Aaron Bond got back to me. He's not, his microphone evidently works now. So uh, that would give him an opportunity. He's our, our, our bus operator of the year. And so, Aaron, I'm, I'm, no, I'm I open up to you. Okay, let's make sure you can hear me first. Can we you hear me? Hear you. Yeah. Thank goodness. I was like, oh, no, I'm going to miss my big opportunity to thank people. <laughs> So I, I had to change some uh, privacy settings. I, I imagine that's what happened. You know, I don't want the government listen, listening to me singing in the shower. So I had to change some privacy settings. <laughs> Anyways, um, thank you, Bruce, Doug, Sam, and the board uh, for the recognition. Uh, it really is an honor to be named Operator of the Year. Um, and because I couldn't have a, a party because of COVID-19, I wasn't able to publicly thank anybody so if i could just have a minute to say a few thank yous 
Um, I'd like to do that now. Please do. Okay. So uh, first of all, I have to thank my buddy Chris Nelson, who's a mechanic at Center Garage. He's been here for over 20 years. He's the one who actually got me to apply for the job of bus operator back in 2007. Um, he told me it would be a perfect fit for me, and uh, luckily he was right. It's been a fantastic career. I really have enjoyed working here. Um, my wife, Tara, um, I wouldn't be sitting here today without her love and support and encouragement. Uh, she's my world. We have two beautiful kids, and we make decisions based off of our family needs, and uh, TriMet was one of the best decisions we've ever made for our family. It uh, has helped provide a very stable life. Uh, having this job has uh, made dealing with hard times and tragedies in life more bearable uh, just because of the stability and the benefits, uh, you know, access to health care, so important. Um, never take that for granted, especially in these times. Um, also, Cindy Debert, she was my original trainer. She's currently the manager of the training department, but uh, she interviewed me on the panel, and she also became my, my original trainer. Um, and I, we always joke about this because on my first day, I had quite the time trying to get down the brakes of, of the bus. I was just stomping on them because I thought, you know, big heavy bus, you have to stomp on those brakes. So I was throwing her around the bus and uh, so much that she had to um, go home and ice her neck that night. Uh, I'm lucky that she kept me and, um, and eventually showed me how to smooth out the brakes. Without her, I wouldn't be here today either. And um, I like to thank the management team over at uh, Merlot Garage, uh, especially my one of my first managers, Jean Cook. Uh, she kind of embodies what a manager and a mentor really is. Uh, from our first meeting, she encouraged me to reach my goals at TriMet and, and at life for that matter. Um, her engage, her uh, encouragement gave me the confidence to become a training supervisor. And it just meant a lot uh, to have a manager build me up and offer me advice and support. So thank you, Jean. Um, also want to thank the people, the people that I work with, uh, the diversity and the culture at TriMet. I'm just so lucky to, to be here with such amazing people, uh, from operators to mechanics, um, supervisors to managers, from the human resources department, PIO, uh, employee communications, the leadership at TriMet, um, ATU. Um, every floor of Center Street, I've met the talented and uh, dedicated employees that really want to make a difference for our customers and the communities that we serve. So I, I think to everybody that I work with, um, you know, it truly is a melting pot here. And uh, we're a good example of how the world could be if, if you just represent everybody. And then last but not least, I just want to thank our customers because without you, I would not have a job, would not be able to feed my kids the way I, I can. So thank you. And thanks again for the time and the recognition, you guys. Sharon, you're entirely welcome. And again, thanks for what you do. And Aaron, we're 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 lucky to have you. We're grateful. Thank you. Thanks, Doug. That would conclude my report, Mr. Pre Board President. You think it is? I have two things. I said oh. one, one, one. I just wanted to let you know that uh, I don't know whether you folks happened to catch the Inside Edition. It's not one of the shows I watch, but they did swabbing of all of the surfaces of the New York subway, trying to determine if it was uh, had the COVID uh, nineteen uh, virus, the coronavirus. And they found nothing, which was amazing. I think they went in trying to do that. But again, it it, it is the, stresses the importance of the cleaning the, our vehicles and stuff on a regular basis. So thanks for keeping that up. Um, and it's appreciated. And then the final thing is, I, I don't know whether all the board are getting these, but I must have over 100 emails from the folks from First Transit who are demanding, I think that we, we demand to try to not abandon frontline transit workers. I want to let them know that I did receive all of their, their emails, and I'm thinking it would be great if we, uh, as uh, an agency, put together a response that we could send back to all those. So maybe I could ask you, Doug, to help yeah. out a response to those so we can, from the board members, I suspect all the other board members be getting these also. So if you could do that, it'd be greatly appreciated. Yeah, happy to do so. All right, thank you. Now, anything else from the... Uh, from the board for Doug. All right, then let's move on. The next item on our agenda is the consent agenda, and there's only one item on the consent agenda. So I'm just going to ask if there's a, a motion to approve the consent agenda, which is the approval of the board meeting minutes for June 24th, 
2020. So moved. Linda. Second, Travis. All right. Thank you very much. Is there any, any additions, corrections on the minutes? <coughs> Hearing none, then all those in favor of the motion to approve the consent agenda as pre presented, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstention? Bruce, I, no abstention or no, no, not opposed, but there were a few typos and I, I didn't identify them, but I'll, I'll get with, um, I'll get with, um, um, Ms. Angrove to uh, correct those. Okay. So the motion is approved uh, and noting that the Director Edwards will get back to Kimberly with the, some minor changes in the, in the all right, then let's move on to the resolutions. The first resolution is resolution 20-07-32, which, which is authorizing a contract modification with Stacy and Whitbeck, Inc. for construction manager slash general contractor services for the track rehabilitation project. Mr. General Manager. There we go, I'm unmuting here, thank you. Uh, yes, Mr. Board President. Um, the uh, it's this resolution is to request the authorization modifying the Stacy uh, Whitbeck uh, for the track rehabilitation uh, program. Now, even as we prepare, and you've heard about this morning from the steel bridge, particularly that that, that complex work, we're looking forward to uh, even future system improvements beyond that right now. Um, the steel bridge is a part of a much larger package of our overall state of good repair and aging rail light rail system. Uh, which also includes uh, the um, uh, Lloyd Max improvements, Providence Park Max improvements, and other projects as well. The resolution before you today authorized construction services for, uh, for this whole package. It includes an allocation for maintenance of way staff to perform emergency work also if needed. Um, and if also, if this is approved, the modification increases the total contract by six million that it also includes a 12% uh, percent change order allowance. Um, it is included uh, in our fiscal 21 and 22 capital, uh, proposed capital budget will be coming for 22, but is approved in the fiscal 21 uh, project budget right now, as well as the maintenance of way uh, budget. For each package of the work, uh, Stacy and Whitbeck, they projected approximately 18% uh, DBE participation, and, um, and they have met that goal in aggregate. Uh, when qualified certified firms were available in the market. Um, I think Steve Witter is available for any other comments or questions. I think maybe actually Dave Sauter as well. So uh, your approval is recommended on this. Uh, Steve, any comments that you might want to add? Uh oh, mute button. Uh, Doug, the only comment I wanted to have is Stacy Whitbeck has performed uh, very well in previous projects, and each one of them has opened back up on time to serve our customers on schedule. Thank you. I think I think you're muted, Bruce. Motion to approve. Thank you. Did I just hear a motion to approve resolution 20-07-32? Yes. And Second, was, Travis. Travis, okay. Is there further uh, uh, comments or questions? Seeing none, then I'm going to call the question. All those in favor of the uh, motion to approve resolution 20-07-32, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Hearing none, the motion is approved unanimously. Thank you very much. Let's move on to the second resolution, which is resolution 2007-33, which is authorizing a contract with Neo Park Transit LLC for inventory ASTM F21 uh, certified surgical mask. Mr. General Manager. Yeah. Thank you much. <laughs> Thanks, Mr. Board President, members of the board. Um, so uh, the resolution before you today, it's now necessary as part of our overall TriMet response uh, to our pandemic and the commitment to provide PPE to the riders and our employees. Um, as you heard earlier, we've installed the mass dispensers on all of our vehicles and distributed about 1.3 million disposable face coverings so far. The particular contract will help us ensure we're able to sustain the effort as long as face coverings are required to slow the spread of uh, coronavirus. 
Um, we did issue an uh, invitation to bid for this contract. And not only did Neopart submit the lowest bid, the bid was 78% lower than TriMet's independent cost estimate. And that was based on pricing for emergency orders of masks earlier in the pandemic. The uh, $1.4 million contract, it covers a five-year term. Uh, the actual cost could be lower, though, as um, it'll be based on distribution, replenishment, supply. Um, we, um, Primate is obliged to purchase 2 million masks during the first year, contract year, but there's no obligation uh, for additional masks on years two through five. So that's a minimum floor that would come with this. Uh, the contract amount, as I've indicated, is for $1.4 million, and it is accounted for in our fiscal 21 uh, budget. Uh, and, and finally, Neopart has 27 employees, of which 26% are minority and 22% are female. Uh, your approval is recommended. And uh, if there's any technical questions, I think Kevin Yin is available as well. All right. Well, let's see if there's any questions. I see uh, Director Bauman has a question. Yes, thank you. Is this contractor actually uh, making the masks or are they a, a distributor? Good question. Uh, Kevin, are you able to respond to that one? I am. I'm here. Thank you very much um, for the question. It is, they're a distributor. Um, they're not the manufacturer. I believe these masks are coming from um, China. So part of the requirements for competing here is that they must have the mask in the house or in the state um, in order to compete because when we do have a need for it, we need to be able to access those masks right away and not wait potentially a month or two months for those masks to arrive or if there's any political issues that could happen. So um, that would stop those deliveries. I guess, right, thinking about just resiliency and if, if shipping is shut down uh, or if supply lines are diminished as they were earlier this year because of the COVID outbreak in Asia. Uh, does anyone make masks in the US? I, again, I'm thinking about just future resiliency to, to be able to access these supplies. Yeah, not 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 to my knowledge. Um, all of most of the PPEs that we have been buying are actually coming from uh, offshore, from overseas. I, I might comment on here that the high volume ones, I think to Kevin's point are offshore. When we were at the very early stages of this virus breaking out, we were making some literally from our residences and locals were making them. But I think they were pretty small in number with not the intent of supplying the general public. So I think the Kevin's reference is really on a mass production basis. Is that fair, Kevin? That is correct. That's correct. Well, it seems seems prudent that, to require that they have the masks on hand, but we're we're sort of running up against a problem that yes. exists all throughout um, the country, which is that we're so dependent on foreign production yeah. of, of these sorts of supplies. And I'll, I'll piggyback on uh, Director Bauman's comment uh, just to point out that Governor Kate Brown has worked with some local uh, producers for masks. I'm not sure what the, the capacity is, the production capacity. I'm not sure what the volumes are, but uh, these are conversations that the state is having looking to actually bolster local production. It'd be good to know if we have any sort of ongoing orders that we're in coordination with anything that state could be doing. This is just about a resilience conversation. I, I might just jump in on this one. Um, I think that's a great point and question. Um, we are closely connected in with Multnomah, Multnomah um, uh, uh, County Health, as well as the state level. We've, and we're also connected in with the FTA. The FTA, in fact, if I recall, donated about a million masks um to us so we are connected in it at, at the local regional state and actually at the federal level and um we're we're uh, we'll take them wherever we can get them including the supply chain director edwards did you have a question my question was more of a follow-up to uh, laurie's question of the resiliency uh, to make sure that we did not have a shortage or um, a lack of being able to obtain uh, masks, you know, when when needed. Um, that that was my first concern. And my second question was just a question in regards to the fact that 
out of, uh, I think, 18 uh, bidders that um, this was the low bid. And there was a very huge discrepancy um, in the bidding levels. Um, Six million, I think, was at the top, look, six million plus, and, and of course, one million plus at the bottom. So I just wanted to get some kind of a handle on why such a large discrepancy. Given given that the scope the scope was the same. Yes, and the the expectation or the um, uh, the quotes that we have asked for is based on two million masks per year, and um, and each one priced them uh, slightly differently, and. Um, um, mind you that masks these days or these surgical masks are priced right now in the marketplace on anywhere from 50 cents to 75 cents each. Um, and so this particular supplier is pricing it strategically. Um, and I think the way they price it, it appears to be that they are, they are lowering it every year, um, thinking that once the, uh, the supply um, is saturated, that the uh, the price of these uh, masks will be lower. So that's my that's my conjecture. So so the integrity of the mask is diminished with the with the price. No, no not not the integrity, but the um, the the cost is um, as through from year two to year five is lower. Because I think the, the strategy that they're thinking is that these prices will come down as the a cure may be found that less folks are actually will be uh, needing to wear these masks um, and or that the supply chain is saturated um, with the uh, with enough supplies that the prices will come down dramatically. Um, my last question is there um, a huge disparity between the durability and quality of the mask? No, they have to meet certain, um, uh, there's a, a, a standard that, uh, that they must meet, otherwise they would be in breach of contract. Okay, thank you very much. Sure. Director Stovall, they see your hand up for a moment and it went away. Uh, and, you know, I, I thought the question, uh, the question, my original question had been answered in uh, a, a prior response, but then uh, the response to Keith, uh, Director Edwards, actually prompted a second question. So, based on what was just referenced, if it, it sounded like they were, the company is pricing based on making some assumptions, and if those assumptions aren't hit or met, there could be a situation where um, we're unable to attain, obtain masks in the future. Uh, you know, we may be able to fulfill orders right now, but what about masks in the future? Because essentially, if uh, if there's a rise in uh, uh, additional things, um, what does that look like? So ultimately, if, they're, if their expectations or assumptions fail to be correct, um, because of the value of the contract, do we have flexibility? As I, I assume we do, but I just want to make sure we're clear. Do we have the flexibility as an agency to say, okay, yeah, you could be in, you're going to be in breach of contract, but that still doesn't get us the PPE we need at the time that we need it. Um, and so we could say you're going to be in breach of contract because you can't fulfill it because you can't get the you can't get the mask at the pricing required to deliver to us at the pricing that you've agreed to, do we ultimately have the ability to go back and say, okay, you know, we know you're gonna need some additional funding to be able to fulfill this order. Yeah, we could we could essentially call, you know, say breach of contract, but yet we're still not gonna get our PPE if we don't actually add additional dollars to the situation. If you understand my question. I mean, do we have that flexibility if something really goes sideways to be able to have a conversation to ensure that we can obtain what we need to obtain to keep our people safe? Sure. Let me see if I can um, if I can uh, answer the questions um, in this way. So the the 
Um, the first guarantee that we have is 2 million masks. That we know they must have. Um, they have certified that they have the 2 million masks on hand. Um, so um, should this pandemic continue, um, and that the 2 million masks should last us a good, um, I would say a good year. Um, but uh, but should we actually have uh, uh, additional needs, we do have the, the ability to excise um, the option to purchase more um, within the first year. If this continues and we are in the second year of the contract and they uh, fail to provide or to have the supply on hand in order to provide us what we need, um, so because if we exercise the option, we would actually, um, uh, uh, they must have at least another 2 million masks in order for us uh, to access. Um, but should they not be able to meet that, um, typically, typically in a contract breach of this nature, um, we could go out and source it as an option uh, through another source, and then they would be liable for the difference in cost between what's contractual price and what is um, uh, what we paid. Um, so that that's a protection for us in in case of a breach of contract. Um, did that answer your it did. question? Absolutely. Okay, Thanks, Kevin. Yep, you you nailed yeah. it. Any other uh, questions? I don't see any. Is the board ready to uh, offer a motion to approve resolution 20-07-? 33. So moved. That was Ozzy, who's who's uh, second? Keith. Keith, all right, thank you very much. Um, any further discussion? Hearing none then, I will call the question. All those in favor of the motion to approve resolution 20-07-33, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Hearing none, the motion is approved unanimously. All right. Uh, our last Chairman, one, Chairman Warner, I'm yes. going to have to take off. Thank you very much. I did know that. Thank you very much. Uh, so the final resolution is resolution 20-07-34, uh, which is authorizing a contract modification to the contract with Mott McDonald LLC for on-call project management, cost estimating, sustainability, and scheduling services. Mr. General Manager. Before I describe this, oh, before I describe this one a little bit, I do, there is one um, uh, correction typo error on here, and I just direct your attention to uh, section eight under financial budget impact. Um, it says $1 million, it should refer to $1,250 million, $1,250,000 which matches actually the final resolution, now therefore be it resolved, which is correct at one, two, five million dollars, two, five, zero million dollars. So just a, a point of correction there. Thank um, you. Th so my, my error, my apologies. Um, yeah, th these services are, are, they're required for our architectural and engineering services. Um, but these are financed also with FTA money. Mott is one of 18 contractors that we secured in 2017 to perform these services and and one of uh, seven specifically to perform cost estimation. Um, since the contracts were executed, uh, TriMet relied more heavily on Cochrane uh, due to a variety of internal and external factors, uh, prompting the request for the mon modification of the amount of $500,000. Again, that's the $750,000 plus the $500,000, which would equate now to the ask of the resolution of $1.250 million. Um, this increased amount has no effect on our fiscal 21 budget as the work performed under the contract is also it's funded from projects that were approved within the fiscal 21 budget fundamentally. Uh, Mott is 18% minority and 21% um, uh, female. And I think uh, Mr. Witter is available if there's any questions on the technical side. So uh, your approval is recommended. Questions Steve, that I'm considering? I'm sorry, Steve, did you have a quick comment? No comments, uh, President Warner. Okay. I missed somebody. I don't see any hands up. Am I missing any board members? 
I'm not seeing anybody with questions or hands up. So, uh, Director Stovall, you look like you're looking to ask a question. All right. Then is there a motion to approve uh, resolution 20 07 34? So moved, Travis. Is there a second? Second, Lori. Second. All right. Thank you very much. So we have a motion on the floor. Is there any further discussion? Okay, hearing none, then I will call the question. All those in favor of the motion to approve resolution 20 07 34, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Hearing none, the motion is approved unanimously. Thank you very much. So looking at the agenda, I see there's no ordinances today. Uh, I will ask that the board consider giving uh, a, a off, this is off uh, docket agenda item, which was as a result of our discussion earlier today, that uh, gives me the authority to uh, draft a uh, letter to the uh, city of Milwaukee in response to their June 16th, uh, a letter to us announcing their intent to withdraw from the TriMet, city of Portland and city of Milwaukee, the intergovernmental agreement for transit police. I talked to you about kind of the things that I would like to see in this letter. Uh, what I'd like is give you give me the, the authority to draft this letter, circulate it to the uh, to the board for their review and uh, edits before we finalize it, and then ultimately have the uh, the uh, the board uh, indicate that they'll they will sign this if they agree with it uh, and be sent to the city for uh, for further follow up if if, they, if it's desired. So. I'd love to see a motion giving me that authority if that's possible. And uh, uh, Ms. Ms. General Counsel, that I am I adequate in my description? Mr. Board President, you are adequate. In your okay, thank you. And so the action, yes, the action would be to give you the authority to draft and circulate that letter and then have all of the board eventually sign it. All right. And so did I hear a motion? Yeah, yeah. Linda, Linda moved, it sounded like. Yeah. And so and second. All right. Any further discussion on this issue? I'm hearing none. Then all those in favor of the uh, motion to give me the authority to draft, circulate, and and get the uh, board signature to uh, send off to the city, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion is approved unanimously. Thank you very much. All right. Um, is there anything else that needs to come before the board uh, this morning? Hearing none, then I'm going to adjourn our business meeting. And uh, I think we probably need a break, right? Before we get it, you're going to give us a briefing on safety and security, right, Mr. Mr. Jean Major? That's correct. Yes. Why don't we take a 10 minute break? Does that sound like enough time for folks? All right. So we'll reconvene about 11 15. Thanks. Let's turn it over to you, Mr. General Manager. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm just going to do a quick handoff here as well. So this is part of our annual safety and security update. Uh, we've got about uh, Marla Blag, I think, is on right now. and is going to walk us through um, the update. And we've got about 12 charts. And I think the uh, general timing plus questions will take about 20 minutes, plus questions the board may have. So Marla, I'm just going to turn it right over to you. Are you there, Marla? You got it. There you go. I think we see you and we can uh, now we can hear you. Now, can you hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, good. OK, sorry. We've got a double clicking going on here with this mouse. Um, so good morning. I'd like to uh, President Warner and Board of Directors. I'd like to provide you with an overview of the safety security division with our notable report of findings for the year. And next slide, please. So um, this is a high level overview of our reportable rail events. We have 143 reportable events and hazards for the year. And what the events or hazards are is close calls involving employees, contractors in the right of way or near misses, doors open on the incorrect side of the platform or train order violations, or it could be a malfunction or failure of the safety critical systems such as tracks, broken rail, traction power systems, 
or other failure of our safety or our system components. And so you can see there were um, eight serious injuries with four significant property damages, and we had no fatalities. Next slide. So uh, safety train collisions, we had a total of 39 train collisions meeting the reporting criteria. Two involved objects, one of which resulted in a greater than $25,000 loss or damage. Five involved another TriMet vehicle, uh, buses or with a non-revenue vehicle. 20 of the collisions involved motor vehicles at grade crossings. And then we did have 12 uh, involved with a person or bicycle. Next, please. Now, if we want to look at um, just kind of the raw data as a comparative analysis, we do see a significant downward trend for 2019. Next slide. And this is a summary of the two highest areas of train collisions, obviously the Portland Central Business District and Interstate Rose Quarter to Expo Center. And Obviously, the Portland Central Business District has the uh, issues with vehicles for traveling in the same um, roadway and not having separated grades. Next slide. Um, Duck had asked um, if we could break down um, the reportable areas for the uh, Central Business District and the significance of this slide will actually allow us to just kind of do that very um, cursory review of the areas of problematic areas for us. And the two highest propensity areas was Sixth Avenue and Morrison Street. And this does help us just reevaluate and look if there's any other environmental situations that could be causing those challenges. Next slide. So um, an overview from the Safety Rail Incident Review Board uh, in the majority of the instance, the other driver performed a maneuver when the train was too close and they actually could not avoid the train. And the FDA's definition between accident and incident, you can see we kind of interchange them here. An accident is higher severity with a higher outcome and an incident is um, an event that happens with no property uh, damage or injury. Next slide. So um, jumping over to our rail uh, pedestrian safety enhancement updates, we completed projects at 10th and Washington, Baseline and 158th and Merlot. And I want to, I just had this confirmed, we did complete all of these projects um, during the timeline as uh, presented above. And so our next project for the next fiscal year will be focusing at Hood Avenue and Gresham. And in fiscal year 21, we will be advancing the design and approvals uh, and expect that in fiscal year 21, however, construction will not happen that year. So uh, there is some work involved uh, moving that next uh, pedestrian enhancement ahead. Next slide. So I wanna highlight our safety and security initiatives for 2021. Uh, we are completing and working on an at-grade crossing study and risk ranking modeling and uh, looking at the methodology for enhancing those improvements. We have a new crash advisory committee that has started to meet and we will be reviewing our uh, crash uh, data and information with the advisory committee and looking for areas for uh, mitigation or prevention. Also, we've talked a lot about the safety management system. This is going to be throughout the entire agency, really changing the safety culture in the organization. We'll be doing major training, a lot of push, a lot of education about uh, SMS, as we call it, throughout the organization. So we really truly make safety a culture and a top priority and core uh, function of our, of our agency. Uh, board members, you will be seeing the uh, public transit agency safety plan coming to you later in the year for adoption for the agency. And um, Doug also highlighted the community listening sessions uh, followed uh, for public, new public safety initiatives that we would like to roll out. Next slide. 
So just a reminder, a lot of people think about the security program as just the Transit Police Division. Um, we also have our unarmed security personnel, G4S and PPI. We have a code compliance program. So this is, makes up our fare inspectors and our customer safety officers from PPI. And they actually focus on code compliance throughout the organization, not just fare compliance. So I want to just make that distinction that they just don't do uh, code uh, or fare inspections. They also, if we have systems uh, or delays in our system, they will help uh, mitigate and, and help with bus bridges and, and other things to support the operations of the organization. We have an emergency management program. Uh, it's a single person, Alex uh, Ubedais, and Alex has done a fantastic job being our TriMet liaison to the state, the governor's office, OHA, and all of our tri-county partners around COVID, the COVID response, and he truly has been an excellent liaison. And then Alex also focuses on all of our training drills and exercises. We have physical infrastructure protection systems. This includes our CCTV program, alarms detection uh, equipment, uh, such as what we have on the Tillicum Bridge, access key control, and also fencing. Fencing is a really important part of our physical infrastructure protection. And then lastly, our crime prevention through environmental design. We really focus on this, trying to make our, our system safer. This is a strategy that we can use to enhance a perception of safety and security through lighting, through fencing. But also it's really important to know that our G4S security personnel that are out on the system make note of facility challenges such as poor lighting or broken lights, uh, crime and blight, so we're able to correct those right away. So that's been a good partnership with facilities and G4S. Next slide. And just real quickly, our results from our 2019 fare evasion survey. Our goal is to improve compliance of, the, of paying fare to use our system. And 18% of the riders did not have a fare when they were riding our system. And so we are seeing a negative upward trend on that. Next slide. And I believe, um, Coming later in this year, we will be giving you a full annual report on fair evasion or on the fair uh, program. And uh, what we've really taken a, a look at is focusing behavior change model on um, our fair and our riders. So 62% of those surveyed without fair indicated they either did not tap, forget to tap or took a chance. So it's really trying to change the behavior of our riders to ensure that they tap every time and um, that they do uh, pay for their fare. Uh, on this survey results, you can see 24% of the riders stated they took a chance. And you know, I've done presentations to you before talking about our types of, of clientele that do not pay and some are unable to pay due to the cost, uh, some uh, will never pay, and others do not know how to pay, and then the, the larger amount of riders is that they take a chance and, and just choose not to pay. And that's where we're really working to change behavior. Next slide. And this is a summary of the proof of payment activity. 3,500 citations resolve, was resolved through administrative options. So really great work on that. Uh, we, uh, it gives us a great opportunity to do honored citizen enrollment. Uh, instead of having a, a fine, riders can do community service and also appeal the ticket. So there was 3,300, over 3,300 warnings issued and then 15,000 citations issued. Next slide. Now jumping over to security highlights. Um, you can see this is showing the number of employee results, uh, assaults, sorry, on employees, supervisors, and contractors. So anybody, even G4S, we capture that uh, amount of data, and there have been over 360 assaults in 10 months. And just since January alone, we've had over 250 uh, assaults. Next slide. 
at our initiatives for fiscal year 21, again, we're really focusing on behavior change and trying to get fair compliance. Uh, we want to obviously reduce operator assaults, but all assaults for all of our employees that are on the system. And we increase uh, rider perception of safety and security on our system by continuing through our physical infrastructure enhancements and improvements. We've identified, uh, we have new um, staff on board that just came on board and are in training. We have eight new proof of payment and code of conduct staff or fair inspectors. And uh, we also will be looking at more um, early morning and late night proof of payment compliance missions and we'll be trying to work with a blended model with community outreach workers to help our non-destination riders with social services or any other quality of life issues that we may see. And lastly, we will be expanding our annual training and recertification to all frontline staff around de-escalation, cultural competency, behavioral and mental health. And I'm happy to report that our uh, FAIR inspector staff, our G4S and our PPI staff have just completed their annual recertification uh, around these areas, uh, these topic areas last week. And that is my report today. Is there any questions? I suspect there probably are, although I see no hands raised right at the moment. Director Way. Yes, Marla, thank you so much for the um, for the overview. I'm wondering, is this briefing also available to us as a board? Um, I don't know if I saw it in the, um, just in our board packet, so. I believe you did have it in your board packet. Um, Doug, okay. can you confirm that? I don't know if I saw that in. Um, this is Bruce. I don't think I saw it either. I think it's. I don't think it is in the in the information that was shared uh, through the. Uh, the We'd web. be happy to provide that for you then. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, You're my welcome. second. Thank you. My second. Um, I guess comment question is, um, you know, you had mentioned the security um, program with the different um, the different folks who play various roles. I'm just curious if you have data or information that we collect around how many of those folks, um, you know, speak additional languages, um, you know, how many of them um, identify, um, uh, you know, have indicated their race or ethnicity, um, because I just feel like um, I want to get a, get a better sense of this, uh, you know, the security um, officers that we have, um, particularly because um, if someone is, um, Again, you know, English is not a first language, or there are just some very real cultural differences. I want to be able to ensure the public that we have folks who are responsive um, to to um, to writers' needs. So, is that the type? Is, is there any demographic information that we collect or that you can share um, with us? Yeah, Director Way, um, G4S just uh, renewed their contract. It went out to RFP, I believe, in 2019, spring of 2019. And in their application, they reported all of that information. It was a requirement of their grant uh, or of their um, application to TriMet for security services. Um, but yes, we could. Um, you know, provide that information to you. That's not a problem. You will be happy to know that our new FAIR uh, inspector recruitment that we have, I believe we have inspectors that speak four different languages. So we really were promoting diversity um, so that our FAIR inspectors reflect the communities that they uh, serve in. Excellent, thank you. And um, just two additional questions. Um, one other question that I had was around um, uh, I saw, uh, you know, one of the reasons why someone may not have um, their fare that day was um, no qualifying ID. And I know that in the past I had raised um, some concerns around that, um, particularly for folks who may, um, you know, be undocumented, right? Um, they, they may uh, 
be uh, afraid um, of, of someone in uniform coming to them and asking for their ID. And so I, I believe in the past I had talked about are there, what are the other forms of identification that we can use? Um, so has there been just um, any additional exploration around that? Yeah, I think one of the, yeah. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, I don't have my um, manager here for the Fair Enforcement Program, but I do believe that we accept school IDs, we accept anything that has a valid name, if someone has a credit card on them, uh, I understand that that has been a challenge in the past and we've done everything that we can to reduce any conflict around that. Okay, thank you. Um, that's helpful. And let's see, I'm trying to think if I have a third. Yes, the third question, uh, final question that I have is around um, the, uh, uh, the accountability piece. So, um, you know, as a board, I believe about a month ago, we received um, the independent um, auditor's report about our, um, you know, about just uh, the transit police and, um, and there were some recommendations that were based off of that. Um, one recommendation um, or an area that we should be looking into was around um, how, do we, how do we properly track complaints? Um, and so, uh, you know, complaints towards Again, you know, security officers or GS4, or whoever it is, there seems to be, um, I guess, according to the report um, and its public information, um, still a little bit of a confusion um, in terms of how the public can um, make a complaint and, and where that complaint would go to and who would ultimately be, you know, responsible for following up. So I'm just curious if, if there has been any um, discussion just from that last, you know, month or so around how we want to handle the complaints? Yeah, um, that's a great question. And actually, uh, what the challenge was is if the public did make a complaint against one of the officers, the city of Portland had difficulty identifying where that home, home base was for that officer, if they were from uh, another law enforcement partner, not from the city of Portland. We corrected that months ago. It was actually cor probably corrected, I want to say, almost a year and a half ago. It's unfortunate that the auditor's report did not know that we had already made that correction, so it was reflected in that. But what we do is the officers have their home agency on their business cards, so when information is given out to the public, they will know where that officer is working and where his home agency is so that the, they will know the correct agency to report um, their concerns. Okay, thank you. Those are some of the questions I had for now. And Director Way, I would point out, I just got a note from Kimberly who said it's now, the, it's number 11 in our packets now. I didn't see it in the, the initial posting. I think she said it wasn't there, but if you look now, I think you'll find it. Okay, thank you. You bet. Uh, Director Simmons, I think you're muted. Marla, um, mine is only a comment. Since I serve on the crash committee, um, the first part of the presentation, I think would be really of interest to the full members of the crash committee. You know, the stuff on um, fair enforcement, I'm not sure it would be relevant, but um, yeah. I, I know you probably plan to share that either at a future meeting or somewhere in between, but I uh, really urge you to do that. I think that will address a lot of questions people had. Yeah, absolutely. We'll include that and we'll probably even do a little bit more of a deeper dive. This was just the highlight. Yeah, well, I thought it was excellent. Thank you. You're welcome. Director Gonzalez. Oh, I thought his hand was up. I don't see his hand now. Yes, I put it down, but didn't unmute myself. The, oh, okay. The, um, thank you, President Warner. I have a question and a comment. Um, my question, I'll start with a comment and then I'll end with a question. So um, I also believe, uh, like Director Simmons, that um, there's another committee that would be interested in some part of this message. I believe TIAC, um, always, TIAC, the, the Transit Equity Advisory mm -hmm. Committee, always it has great interest in the issues of fair enforcement in general. 
Um, but I believe uh, knowing a little bit about how these different scenarios play out, um, if someone doesn't have proper ID, what are the proper responses? How can they advise their constituents? Those sorts of things would be useful. I would certainly um, encourage our TIAC uh, director to help us bring that kind of conversation to the group. Um, and, and I'll go to my question now because it, it goes upon the kind of things that I, I would hope we can discuss in a forum like TIAC. The 2%, uh, you mentioned a little bit earlier, uh, there's 2% of those evading fares based on the, the, the data gathered are individuals who claimed they did not, they could not afford the fare. Um, I, I know the, the challenges there are for folks that, uh, are, you know, are, are hard up to be saying, you know, I, I don't have the money and I know we have a low income, um, fair program. So could you just help me understand, uh, you know, on the ground when there's someone that claims that they cannot afford the fare is inside that 2%, are we, are we looking at people that have already looked at the low income, how uh, low income, uh, fair program and determined they do not qualify? Is this more of a self, uh, a, um, self designated, uh, um, statement of, I do not qualify how, how much, uh, how, how do we arrive at, at those that represent the 2% as far as what kind of questions or what kind of responses determine that for the evaluators, the fair enforcers, pardon me. Yeah, so on this particular survey, the 2% indicated they could not afford fair was uh, when the surveyor went up and talked to the individual, that is what they reported. So it was a self-report. Uh, the, this particular survey, I don't think they did a lot of education um, follow-up, um, but we can confirm that I wasn't out when they were doing the surveys, but uh, these were all self-reports from the writer. Uh, Marla, this is Bernie. I can confirm that, that the way that this survey works, uh, TriMet's uh, kind of an unusual agency. Most transit agencies don't perform this kind of um, uh, polling of their of their customers, but uh, we do a regular process of of uh, having pollsters go out, uh, interviewers go out with the fair enforcement team. They're um, doing fair enforcement, but they're not issuing any citations or warnings. They're just asking for folks' ID. I mean, for their um, for their uh, fare and. Uh, if they find that somebody hasn't paid their fare, they ask them if they'd be willing to answer questions from the, the survey takers. And so they ask them a series of questions to try to understand why they didn't pay their fare. If they say they just couldn't afford it, they don't dig any deeper into that and say, have you looked at the low income fare program and, and so forth. I appreciate the clarifications. I have a comment. Uh, thanks, Marl. I appreciate the information. I guess I never really saw the uh, assaults when you add in the employees, supervisors, and contractors. That number's huge to me. Uh, don't like that at all. So thanks for sharing that. I um, it'd be interesting to know the breakdown of the of the various components. Uh, we've talked a lot about the the operators, and I, I thought those were more in the single digits. Um, but this is this is dramatic to me, and so uh, seems like something we definitely should be getting a handle on and figuring out how to how to deal with that. So thanks for sharing that. If you have any co further comments, I'd love to hear them. Yeah, President Warner, it is, it is um, unfortunate. What we're seeing is there will be a, a rider operator conflict, and um, it starts to escalate and they will call in a supervisor and it will continue to escalate and they'll yeah. call in G4S and, and it will continue to escalate in some cases where um, then the police are called to, to help um, mitigate the situation. But they, you know, we kind of laugh, we were just saying earlier today that the bus barriers, our whole intent of getting these bus barriers was a mitigation strategy to reduce the operator assault. 
who would have thought that the bus barriers are a COVID a communicable disease um, prevention mitigation too. Um, COVID is, is, we're seeing increased trends too with increased assaults with COVID. We've had a lot of discussion about mask enforcement and in trying to enforce the physical distancing and, and it causes conflict. And just this weekend, uh, one of our operators um, was unaware um, when they were asked someone to give the proper social distancing and the person didn't like the operator giving that request and that person pulled out um, a gun and pointed it at the operator and we had a rider uh, call that in. Now it was not, um, it was an airsoft rubber bullet. However, it's still very frightening and, and very scary for our riders to see that, but also for our employees being uh, affected by that. Wow. Well, keep us posted on those those numbers. I really like to understand how, how they are and where they are. So thanks. Hey, I, I might add on to this. I think this is part of this whole review of safety security that we're looking at, not just uh, for our customers, but also our contractors and employees as well. Um, and so there's a whole spectrum here for us to really undertake. So um, there, there's an immense complexity on this. And is a bit even back to fair enforcement is we, we've come to the policy of inform don't enforce we don't want anybody hurt over two dollars and fifty cents um a customer or our cell or our employees the same thing applies over tensions around masks and covid and sanitizers and um with the world we live in now the 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 agitation level is 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 high right now and so we've got we're trying to get our mind around that. It's part of these listening sessions, from my perspective, it's for everybody to feel safe, and uh, it's it is not an easy thing, and uh, um, it, and so we're we need help. Um, and this is also a national trend. This is not just here in Portland. This is going on all over um, all over the United States right now. All right, how's the board doing? Are we uh, ready to call today? I think everybody's not nodding their head here. First off, thanks to the board for all of your time today. Uh, it was a long day and I appreciate it a lot. And, and also, Doug, thanks to you and the staff for helping us out on this. This was a, a good day. We had a lot, a lot accomplished and uh, a lot of good information. So uh, we look forward to our next meeting and, uh, and uh, we will all say goodbye right now. Have a great rest of the day, you guys. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.